working on them for Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof, and Actually, it seemed like she had done it. Like you like what you did. Yeah. Oh, so I wasn't in Highlanders. Right. No, I know. I realized Got that. It. But I didn't know how long she had been doing it with yeah. the junior high. Yeah. I know you from somewhere. the year before. It must have been the year ready? before when Brynn was in fifth grade and we came and saw him play in the arena. The Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. yeah. Roar and tumble at your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh. Morning breaks in glory. 
nation sings your story as your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise song we did last week, so I'm not going to have you sit down. But anyway, um, theme last week I thought was living in the spirit, Romans chapter 8. So we did all the Romans chapter 8 songs last week. But uh, this week, it's actually what Bill's preaching on. So this, this song's talking about how we look to the spirit for our strength and our help. So here's how it goes. I'm going to take one second. I got a new string. It's, so you don't have to listen to it out of tune. Does anybody have a joke? <laughs> I'm standing here with open arms I'm learning where my help comes from I'm singing like the battle's won I'm learning where my strength comes from Not by power, not by might By the Spirit of God Up to the heavens I lift my eyes Fully surrendered All of my life I'm laughing in the face of fear Cause your perfect love is with me I'm living in your victory Cause heaven is surrounding me Not by power, not by might By the Spirit of God Up to the heavens I live by Not by power, not by mind. 
Sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord there's Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. 
Father, we um, we come into your presence here together, and we um, we worship, we look to you, and we just thank you for the love that you have shown to us, that um, that you give to us through your presence and through each other. Lord, we ask your your guidance here in this time, and uh, we know there are many things that that are weighing on us. There's some some healing, some sickness, that some healing that needs to happen, and um, there's just circumstances, situations in our lives, and Lord, we lay those before you this morning. We pray for those who are hurting, Lord. And Father, um, again, guide us through this time uh, together in worship, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome to Morello Hills. You can be seated if you'd like. We do have a couple of groups that have started pretty recently and uh, just this last couple of weeks. Um, one is on Sunday mornings and you are invited to participate. It's, uh, we're going through the screw tape letters. It's kind of a, this is an old book. The ones that uh, most people have look a little newer than that. But um, you are invited. You can jump right in and uh, participate in that if you'd like. We just started a purpose-driven life uh, class on Tuesdays. That just started last week. You could jump in this week, and you would not be much more behind than I am right now already. So, uh, so just uh, consider those things as a place to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus, in uh, your faith. Um, so consider that. We also have homework helpers. Uh, we took last week off because there were parent-teacher conferences at Morello Park. And um, so that starts again tomorrow. If you're interested in helping with that, let me know. We can use, we've had about 10 kids so far, and we expect that that could definitely grow. So there's some other things flashing through there. If you're interested in any of that, uh, fill out a connection card. If you're visiting today, you can fill out a connection card. If you have a prayer request, any of those things. 
All right, so Kendra's going to let us know a couple of things before we uh, have the kids take off. Good morning. So, unfortunately, we did not have enough cars to, like, sign up for uh, Trunk or Treat, so we can't really pull that off. But um, Sunday, Halloween is on a Sunday. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a fun event on Sunday, right here, right after church. <laughs> we'll have food. We'll have bounce houses. Um, I'm going to set up a photo booth so you can take pictures. Uh, we'll do goodie bags for the kids. It'll be fun. Um, and let your kids come in costume. Don't bring them in bloody, gory costumes. <laughs> but... Um, I mean, you're dressed up right now, right? <laughs> um, but the kids will come up on stage and do a little dance with their costumes on. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so second Sunday of October is known as Pastor Appreciation Day. Um, although we appreciate them every single day. But we are blessed to have a wonderful, amazing lead pastor and a wonderful youth pastor, although I don't see him right now. <laughs> so, Bill, will you come up, please? And William, if you're here, although I don't see you. I will accept on behalf of all, of all Williams. <laughs> so we yeah, took... William's actually, he's, he's guest preaching at another church oh, today. Okay. So he's, 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 he's being, being a pastor. Appreciated yeah. somewhere else well, right now. Thank you very much. So that's our love offering. The children last week made little sheep heads and took a group picture for you. <laughs> you can see it up there. That says, wow. thank you from your little flock. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I was wondering what the sheep, the sheep stuff was for. That is very cool. So thank you for shepherding our flock so well. You're so loved. You're so appreciated. Thank you for everything. So thank you very much. And that's it. That's it for me. Well, I didn't actually forget. I was yakking with Mark back there. He distracted me. <laughs> Only because I didn't know it was Pastor Appreciation Day. I didn't read last week's bulletin, I guess, because it ain't in this week's. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to communion time. We have trays scattered throughout the sanctuary for you to have your communion. I seem to be getting, my communion devotionals seem to be getting smaller and smaller. Now it's down to about three quarters of a page. But it's what you put in it that counts. When I was a youngster, I always remember hearing, don't judge a book by its cover. And, then I, get, and I found out later, at the time I didn't even pay attention, but a book meaning a person, the cover meaning that person's appearance. I found out sometimes things aren't always the way they look. As I got older, I noticed that some people always, or at least it sure seemed that way, got away with doing all kinds of bad things and stuff. They never seemed to get in trouble. They never seemed to get caught. When I asked about this, I was told God knows what they did. And someday, we all answer to him. I was told to worry about my own actions, not what others did. Or I guess in biblical terms, you might call that, judge not, least ye be judged. As Christians, we're called to spread, spread the word of God, it says, to the entire world, not just to our own congregation or neighborhood. 
We are told to accept people for who they are, not for who we wish them to be. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 44 through 47. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? For our communion, and again, um, we have communion in five places. There's three at the back and then two in the front. And you are on your own to get that and then um, take it back to your seat with you after uh, I pray here. Father, we, um, we are grateful to be together uh, around the table um, of communion, of the Lord's Supper, remembering uh, your Son. And so, Lord, we celebrate the forgiveness we have. We celebrate grace as we take communion together. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. That was that was nice, very nice. Well, since Steve is not here, I can set this on here guilt-free today. So. <laughs> Which uh, yeah, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> well, welcome again. We are, um, if you have a, a bulletin, it's uh, good to have something to write on sometimes. Um, as I say, you might just want to draw a picture, you know. Um, sometimes that's a helpful way to process, but there is 
A sermon notes page uh, it has a nice little triangle on it there, so you, something to color in, you know. It's like a coloring page. Um, and I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, so I do want to do a little bit of review. We are doing uh, the series Mentally Healthier, and we've talked about many aspects of our, our mental and spiritual health. And today we are moving more into, um, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit, how we, we lean into the Holy Spirit, what Paul talks about as he uh, unfolds that in Romans chapter 8. And so that's what we're, we're going to get into today. Um, I do, you know, I don't know exactly what you're doing for your own quiet time, your own spiritual growth. I hope, I somewhat expect that if you are a believer, if you've, if you've given your life to Christ, that you have some kind of habits. You're here today. Uh, that's part of it. Um, and, you know, going through books like the Screw Tape Letters and the Purpose Driven Life, those are just places to help, help us dig in a little bit or maybe get inspired, too, and maybe be able to process our faith together. We had just some wonderful discussion this morning uh, around the screw tape letters, just about some of the ways that Satan tends to trip us up, tends to get in our minds and, you know, needle us or, or push us in, in the wrong direction. So I encourage you to take on something, whether it's a class that we offer or, or a, a reading outline. The version obviously, is a great place to find some helpful stuff as, as well. But let's look a little bit uh, at where we've been. Today, we're kind of, we're still pushing into balance, but I'll push that a little bit. Uh, we'll talk more about that, but I, I'm still thinking about living a balanced, spirit-led life, a, a life in Christ, the, the life that God really wants for humans to have, uh, to rely on Him as we, you know, go through this, this part of our life uh, on earth before we get to the eternal part of our life. Uh, and I do think the fruit of the Spirit reflects that, reflects kind of the whole, you know, what are we giving out? How are we living uh, for Christ? So we're on this challenging and rewarding journey. There will be trouble, but Jesus says, I'll take care of you. You will be rewarded here and in eternity. Be diligent. Keep your responses to circumstances selfless and simple. Humble obedience is what I'm calling you into. And don't forget to rest. Others are not dictating your life. I, Jesus, am guiding you. And then he also tells us not to worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? So we thought about worry as well. Last week, we, we thought, you know, just simply before we talked to Brittany, following Jesus, um, you know, getting physical activity, just the importance of that. Sometimes we take the quick, quickest route, you know, um, like at the grocery store. You know, we're, we're fighting for that closest spot, right? And you could think, well, maybe we should park a little further away and, and walk and have some time to think. And so sometimes it is that or take the, even do the longer line, you know, at the grocery store. And, you know, if our life is making us rush all the time, maybe we do need to take a s say no to something. And so that's the emphasis there. Rest more, walk more, minister more, have conversations, be available for people that God connects you to. So that was, that was last week. So let me pray. Father, we, um, we come before you, and, and we want to walk... We want to go through this life uh, as close to you as possible. There are a lot of things to distract us, a lot of things to confuse us. But help us to focus on you, to stay close to you, Lord. And may these um, messages, may these words today be helpful in that. In Jesus' name, amen. So balance. What, do we, what kind of balance do we want in life? I, I used the example last week of doing the, the sporting event where there's three sports and, you know, a little triathlon, and I used the example of walking through the water stations, right? 
And it's important to focus on what I, what I think of balance, it's not like the three sports or like doing as much as you can or having a, a variety of things that you're involved in. It's more about the pace. It's more about the pace. Are you setting a pace for your life and your faith that you can stay the course on? At times you want to run. You're going to all in, and maybe you're, you're saying, I'm going to teach a children's class. I'm going to volunteer homework helpers. I'm going to do a small group. And maybe that's a little faster pace for you. Could be. Um, and then at times, maybe you have you take a step back from that, and you have a little bit different pace. So what I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize is your pacing. Keep a pace that the Spirit is directing you in and that you can keep up that you can keep up and feel energized in. There's this um, idea put out there by the 3DM people, and we've used this for probably 15 years now, uh, and it's, it's, it's this shape, and I forgot about this slide before the shape, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about balance from a, a few different angles, but today we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit. But the shape here is the, uh, the up, in, and out. And uh, how many, how, is that, who does that look familiar to? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. So that's like the basic shape of this one ministry. Uh, it's a discipleship ministry. And the idea is emphasizing our relationship with God, our up, you know, our connection to God. Are in our relationship with other believers, like in a church, a small group, uh, other people that you're connected to that you might talk about your faith with. Our in is that, what we do together as believers. And then our out, how we love the community, how we look at the people in our neighborhood that, that may or may not be believers, especially thinking about how we connect with people that are outside of the church or outside of faith. And so in that is a good balance, right? If you can be out of balance, if all you do is just, you know, I think God would still direct you in this, but if, if all you do is read the Bible and pray and you never talk to anybody about your faith, you never do, you know, fellowship with other believers, you may be out of balance, right? If... Um, if all you're doing is one of these areas, you can get yourself out of balance. And so you want to think about how can I keep a strong relationship with God and other believers and then also loving the people around me. I think it's a helpful tool just to think about what I'm doing every day, what I'm doing in my life. So I do, you know, the question as far as balance, is spiritual balance the most healthy mentally? And um, I think so. But somehow, sometimes church people can be the most stressed out of any because we can, we can work each other too hard. We can cause too much stress in each other's lives. And so, you know, there... Has anybody ever used guilt to manipulate manipulate anybody? Has anybody has anybody had somebody else use guilt to manipulate you? We'll say we'll ask it that way. Not if you've used guilt. But but sometimes that can happen in church communities. You can feel guilty. Now, <laughs> you know, the conviction. What is conviction, right? Uh, there's some guilt associated with conviction, I think, at times. But we have to bring it all through the filter of through our relationship with God and maybe talk about it with other believers. And so in church, we don't want to get overburdened, you know, feel like, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to I got to keep busy. I got to we want to have the right pace. Right. And so. It's not just enough to say, I'm going to go to church and then I'm going to be mentally healthy. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes people do that and they just get overwhelmed. And so you still have to bring any everything under God's authority and say, no, I can't do everything. I'm going to do what God shows me to do. Now, <laughs> you know, there's that 
lots of good illustrations about letting go, right? The monkey in the trap is the great one, right? Where the monkey puts his hand in a trap uh, with nails sticking in, and he can get his hand in there, right? And then he grabs the nut or whatever at the bottom of the hole, and he won't let go because he wants that thing, but he can't pull it out with the fist, and then the hunter comes and clobbers him on the, clobbers him on the head, and there goes the monkey. But sometimes we're like that. We don't want to let go of this thing, right? And then, and then Satan comes and clobbers us on the head. I don't know exactly how to unfold all that. But sometimes we do have things that we have to let go of. And that can help us create a better balance in our life. And I know you know that. Now, I want to, to pivot here into Romans 8. But before that, I'm going to use um, some of Max Lucado from the grip of grace, and some of you know this, this story that he starts this. This is a, a study on Romans, and I highly recommend it, and Max Lucado's awesome. And then I'm also going to use Rick Warren today, a message that, that I found of his, and so I'm going to rely on those two helpful teachers uh, today. And the first is, as a, you know, Romans, how many have read Romans? Anybody? <laughs> read Romans at some point. Uh, it, it, it's It's in-depth and sometimes it's hard to understand sometimes it's easy to understand but it's all good stuff now he starts out and so this is max lucato helps with creating a parable of the first three chapters of romans one through three and i'm gonna do it really quickly he adds more details um but he tells this parable about these five brothers that lived with their father in a kingdom they had it all it was all good and uh, three of them uh, or four of them decided they, they they were told not to play too close to the river four of them went down played too close to the river and got swept down way away from the kingdom and so they're way down and they're way separated from the father you kind of get it now right they're separated from the father and they're in this you know country that they don't know nothing about, and they have to decide what are they going to do now? How are they going to get back to the Father? Well, the first one described in Romans 1, 18 through 32, is a hedonist, and Max Lucado calls him hut-building hedonist. It's just trying to find uh, his fulfillment or her fulfillment through pleasure and embracing kind of the world, embracing the worldliness around them. And um, so they, they kind of just dig in there with the world, so to speak, or that world that they got swept to. The second is the fault-finding judgmentalist. And um, so this is described in 2, 1 through 11. And this person uh, finds their identity in looking at the hut-building hedonist and saying, and taking notes, saying, I'm taking all the notes on what my brother is doing wrong. And so finds his identity in just looking at his sinful brother, right, who is probably sinful, and just taking notes to show the father when he gets back, right, and becomes obsessed with that. Now, the third is this one, the rock-stacking legalist. This is the one that says, I'm going to, I have to do, I've sinned, I'm a bad person, starts whipping himself, right? And he says, I'm going to find my, I'm going to make my way back to the Father. It's like miles and miles and miles away. I'm going to snack rocks. I'm going to make it all the way up to the back to the Father. And it's impossible. It's an impossible journey. Described in Romans 2, 17 through 3, 20. So these are kind of the state of humanity as Paul presents it. The hedonist, the judgmentalist, and the legalist. And that's often where we find people in this world around us in one of those three places. Well, the, for, the fourth brother is there saying, we need to wait. God's, our, our oldest brother is going to come back. Our oldest brother is going to come back and help us restore this relationship. And the three others say, oh, forget it. He's never coming back. Well, the older brother representing Jesus. So the grace-driven Christian stays focused on there's a way. God, my Father is going to provide a way. The Christ follower described in 3, 21 through 25 describes us, the believers, as co-heirs with Christ in the chapter that we're about to talk about, 
Romans 8, 17, described as co-heirs, brothers, with Jesus himself. And so then the fifth brother is Jesus himself. He is the righteousness of God. He is the one that has come to help us, restore us to the relationship with our Father. And so this is important for me when I read this years ago now. Um, I won it. So it's a signed copy by Max Lucado himself. Look at that. Ooh. All right. <laughs> um, so when I read that, I thought that was enlightening for me as I, as I enter into Romans and kind of see, you know, he's describing how mankind tends to think and the right way is that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how we get back. That's how we're restored. Not by hedonism, not by judgmentalism, not by legalism, obviously. And so that's the, the framework with which Romans is written upon. And so, you know, Jesus says we're going to get the Holy Spirit. He's going to go away. We're going to get this counselor so that we could be mentally healthier. We're going to get the counselor of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, the chapter we're talking in, through, and, and we'll kind of end there today. And if, um, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who lives in you. And that's what we are depending on. That's what we are leaning on. The fruit of the Spirit we talked about earlier, and that's what we want to have come out of us. And then we don't have to do it all. We don't have to do all the different activities in a church or the requirements of, of what it takes to do any activity, any ministry. We want to rely on each other. There are some who are called to, and the list here is, Prophesy or, or preaching is, is another way to, you know, describe that gift, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, and showing mercy. And there are other gifts or many gifts lift, listed in the scriptures. So we rely on each other, and that creates balance in the community of the church as well. Now, what gets in our way? How do we become mentally unhealthy or spiritually unhealthy? Well, there are three things that, that come against us. And um, one is the world, right? We live in this world, and it has, it has a lot of its own messages that, that it sends to us and our children and the people, our neighbors around us. And they at times are contradictory to what we find in Scripture, what we talk about here. And so there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of lies. Satan himself contends against us. He is the tempter. He's the great tempter. And we're thinking about that as we read through the screw tape letters. So Satan, you know, James um, and Peter both describe Satan like, well, I think it's just in Peter, like a lion waiting for somebody to devour. And the world throughout Scripture is described as kind of the, where the enemy has some influence, right? And then the third one, so we got the world, we got Satan. You know what the third one is? Third one's the worst one of all. And you know what it is? It's you and me. It's ourselves. And so James, when he talks about temptation, he says, you know where it comes from? <laughs> Yourself, your inner desires, and they... They give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so Satan works through that. The world works through that. And so the biggest thing that we have to contend with, you ever heard the saying that you've heard this? You're your own worst enemy, right? Yeah, sometimes. Do you feel that way? Sometimes I see it, you know, in myself. Sometimes I see it in some, man, you're your own worst enemy. Stop telling yourself that. Stop thinking that way. Stop doing that. Stop having that mindset. Well, there are some weapons for self-destruction. 
And here's seven of them. And these are, as we, we enter into Romans 8, uh, Paul is, is teaching us how to rely on the Holy Spirit in the midst of these lies that come, you know, Satan comes at us, but, uh, and at times it's reinforced by the world, but, but these lies come from deep inside us as well. So the first one is shame. Now, when you feel ashamed, you feel guilty, you have regrets, and, you know, you just, you live with these regrets. Now, I know if I ask you, do you have any regrets, you could all say yes. But it's like Satan wants to remind you of those things and make you live there and make you stay there. I think some of these can be, like something like shame might move us to repentance, but most of the time, it's just something to make you feel bad about yourselves, something that just causes that temptation to happen. The second is uncontrolled thoughts. Um, and so in that, you just let your thoughts go out of control, and you don't bring them under the authority of God. Then compulsions, these inner desires, and that's really what, what James is talking about in these compulsions, we just feel like we want to do that. And so then we, we can't stop it. We just go do it. You know, we have some, some sort of thing in front of us, like we're trying to eat better, and, and we, uh, we start thinking about something we really like. We start thinking about Taco Bell, and we're just like, I'm just going to go do it. I'm just going to go do it right now. I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it over with. I'm going to get it over with, right? And so we can feed those compulsions. Fourth one, fear. And this is an enormous destroyer of happiness. And we, we limit ourselves when we just focus on our fears. Hopelessness. Where we, you know, that's, you know, a, a cousin of depression for sure. And we just feel like nothing's going to work out. We may be in a marriage that's tough. We may be in a job that's tough. And we just are feeling hopeless about what our circumstances is producing. Bitterness is a huge one, right? Because we, the world is always fair, right? No, the world is always not fair. It, not always, but often. Okay, I'll use often. The world is often not fair, and then we get bitter because it's not fair, and we just become more and more bitter, and it'll eat us alive. It's a poison. It's like a cancer that it just causes us to dwell on this, you know, this inequity that we can't get over. Insecurity. And this is the one where... If you live in your insecurities, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to just build yourself up all the time. And you're just constantly feeling like you're less than, but you put out a good face. And you're kind of being fake. You're kind of being a poser, right? And people can usually see through that. And it's a destroyer of what God wants for us. Now, Romans 7 talks a lot about that tension, right? I know what I want to do, but I can't do it, Paul says. And I, we all like reading that. If you've read that before, and we've brought that in the sermons as well, we know what we, you know, Paul says, I know what I want to do, but I can't quite do it. And at times, it's just, it's frustrating that we can't quite do what we know God wants us to do. And that's why we surround ourselves with people that um, can encourage us and we immerse ourselves in God's Word. A lot of times, we can try self-help, you know, and we can try ideas to kind of get us going the right direction. And I think there can be a connection between Scripture and living in the Holy Spirit and self-help. But actually, we're, we're talking about digging deeper than just 
doing the right things. We're talking about allowing the Spirit to control us. So let's look into the beginning of Romans 8. How can I be set free from me? How can I be set free from me? Remind myself daily what Jesus did for me. Remind myself daily. Write that down on your notes there, what Jesus did for me. The Holy, so right off the bat, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. When you belong to Christ Jesus, there is no shame. There is no condemnation. And we have to believe that. We have to hang our hat on that. We have to remind ourselves. We have to remind Satan when he tempts us that I am now Jesus's. And so when we, um, when we come against some of the things that trip us up, we have to point to Jesus and say, I am his because Jesus died for me and I have that, uh, his presence. He stands for me and I can point to him at every moment. So the second phrase here, the power of the the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you through Christ Jesus from the power of sin that leads to death. So, a lot of us rely on just our own willpower, right? And we have to keep pushing into God's power in the midst of whatever is going on for us. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. Um, so, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you're saved? Is it because you keep the Ten Commandments? Is that why you're saved? Or maybe the 11 or 12 or 13 or 732 commandments. Can anybody say the all 10 commandments? Some of you probably can't. <laughs> Why are you saved? You're saved because of the love of Christ. You're saved because of Jesus standing in for us. And we can, you know... If I had a, a pig here, and uh, it was all dirty, right, and um, I cleaned it up, you know, we had a, just a party. We, we all participated. We just cleaned that thing up and made it as shiny new as we possibly could. Now, yesterday, we ate a pig, and uh, that was pretty good. But, um, you know, we got to the end, and it would still be... A pig, right? It would still be a pig. It would be unchanged. But Christ, and so we try to clean ourselves up, but we are still tainted by our sin. And so when we do it without Christ, when we do it without God's help, we're only going so far. And we have to remember that the law or being, you know, whatever that constitutes, it could say, you know, it could be a political thing. You know, we need to have better laws around here. And, you know, we've had a lot, of, a lot of stuff around that over always, right? But recently, maybe. But really, hard, it's the change of heart in people where, where change actually happens. Our legal system can do whatever it wants to do, but people are pretty good at breaking the law, right? People are pretty good at breaking the law. And so we got to remember that change only comes through a heart given to Christ and fully devoted on Him. And so for ourselves, the power to change comes from Jesus Himself. So God did, we go on there, the law of Moses could not save us because of our own sinful nature. And so because we're so good at breaking the law, but God put into effect a different, sorry, I need to 
move my slides forward, but God put in effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. God destroyed sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And so what happens is that Christ, as we've said, stands in our way, but he's Provided this way through grace, we talked a lot about, we always talk a lot about because we depend so heavily upon the grace. Now, grace saves us, right? If you're saved, if you're here right now and you've given your heart to Christ, you're saved. But grace, and this is where sanctification and we use terms holiness and that sort of thing, grace also helps us to become clean, to You know, our righteousness is like filthy rags, right? But through grace, God God helps us make better decisions. Now, how do we change what we do or our feelings? How do we change our feelings? Now, you... um, You know, you may be in a relationship... Um, to your a parent and a child, and you may just not feel like you like your child anymore. <laughs> you know, that sounds sad. Okay, uh, it could be a marriage, it could be a job, it could be a friendship. Um, you may not feel like you believe anymore. It could be your faith. How do you change your feelings? That's really complicated, right, at times. Because you can't just say, I just change how I feel. Part of it has to happen through your mind and your actions, right? Sometimes when you don't feel like going to church or you don't feel like reading the Bible or you don't feel like loving somebody close to you, sometimes what you have to do is do the right thing. And you have to change how you think a little bit and say say somebody is is making you mad a lot right and you dwell on it you dwell on it a lot you need to stop dwelling on it you need to stop dwelling on that thing that's happening and change the way you think about it and then you could do something nice for somebody right change your actions change how and Eventually, your feelings will follow suit if you, if you do that. But it's, it's challenging, and what we're doing is we're relying, we're saying sin doesn't control me. Jesus controls me, and sometimes I just have to know that. Does that make sense? Sometimes I just have to know this and walk in that kind of obedience because our emotions, our feelings will lean on We'll go all over the place, right? So remind myself daily what Jesus did for me is that's taking captive my thoughts and bringing them under his authority. He did this so the requirements of the law would be fully accomplished for us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the Spirit. So, We have this ability that transcends our own ability. Because why? Because Christ died for us. So we're going to, that's where we're going to end today. We're going to get through the first point. And then we'll do do about six or less next week. Um, But I will show you the other two because some of you, you have a blank on your outline and you're going, I want to know what that blank is right now. But we're not going to cover it until next week. So, the second blank is ask the Holy Spirit to give me better thoughts, which we've talked about a lot already, but we'll push deeper in as well. And then the last is um, realize I have a new ability to say no. Realize I have a new ability to say no. So the mind, I'll, I'll, the mind governed by flesh is hostile to God. 
It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Actually, there was another verse that I want. Oh, oh, verse 12 in the New in the Living Bible. Worship team, you guys can come up. So, dear brothers, you have no obligations, whatever, to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. Okay, that's the bottom line. Can you say that with me? Just say what's on there. You ready? So, dear brothers, you have no obligations, whatever, to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. Amen? Amen. All right, why don't you stand up? Here's, here's some thoughts for next step as you think about how to live with the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Do you have a daily spiritual habit? For that, I asked that at the beginning. I just can't encourage that more. I hope that, that you have something daily that you do. And so, you know, what was the first point? Remind myself daily what Jesus did for me. And that's part of what happens on our daily spiritual habits. Will you ask the Holy Spirit for better thoughts? Maybe you have perfect thoughts. I don't know. But that's a place of application. That in that t- quiet time, that time with God, ask the Holy Spirit to give you better thoughts. And one thing that you need to say no to. You know, what is there in your life that I just need to say no. We, we've gone through a couple of Bob Goff things, and he says every Thursday he quits something. What do you need to quit this Thursday? What do you need to say no to this Thursday? Father, we, uh, we come before you, and, and we want to uh, be healthy. We want to be spiritually healthy. We want to be mentally healthy, emotionally healthy. Lord, but beyond all that, we want to be fully dedicated to you. So, Lord, maybe we listen to you in the midst of sometimes confusion, some of the things that can trip us up, Lord, some of the deceptions that can be around us. So, Lord, give us your strength. May we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very word Spoken to me And I This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my day. Bread. 
This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I I'm desperate. sums up things well whatever things are lovely if there's any praise think on these things it's a good challenge there hey thank you for your for the cards and your appreciation Uh, i do feel appreciated i know william does as well so thank you for that um you know i don't think we mentioned the samaritan's purse i saw some boxes there come in uh so those boxes what is that called it's Thank you, Operation Christmas Trout. Um, so we have boxes for those. Thank you. And uh, if you'd like those, make sure you, you get those in the foyer. And then the youth room is coming along. It's all painted, and it looks great up there. We will get new carpet uh, in a few weeks uh, when we can get that set up. But feel free to go up, check it out. It's, it's coming along. All right. Have a wonderful Sunday. <laughs>